earlier this week, I was reading the Daily Telegraph out there in Brussels, uh, and I came across one of the op-ed pieces, and I started to read it. And I thought, my word, this is sound stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> I hadn't bothered to check who was writing it. So I, I glanced at the byline, and who was it but the Reverend Peter Mullen. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I had some profound observations to make about um, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury that I saw. Um, but I was struck, Peter, by something that you particularly said. You said that if organizations get to a certain size, they cease to be concerned about the interests of those they were formed to serve, and they become concerned instead with the interests of those they employ. Mm -hmm. Now, you were speaking of the National Health Service, but I thought immediately, and with great affection of the European Union, that the <laughs> European institutions profoundly now serve the interests of the people who work in them. Mm -hmm. And they have given up any thought uh, of serving the interests of uh, people like us. In fact, they have a contempt for public opinion. Yes. And yes. when you yes. see yes. Yes. things like uh, the referenda that have taken place over the years, one after the other, in different countries, in Denmark, in Ireland, twice, in France, in Holland, and those results are just put on one side uh, by the European institutions. Occasionally they will wring their hands and they will say, perhaps we haven't explained our position <laughs> well enough to people. Well, for the last 12 years, I have spent most of my time explaining the European Union to people, and my experience is the more I explain it, the angrier they get. <laughs> and then Lord Stoddart's wonderful speech, that was absolutely magnificent, and I, was, I, I agree with all that you said, and in particular, I was thinking that you said it was 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you made your first speech uh, against Britain joining the European Union. And I have a confession to make, I am afraid that 50 years ago, I would have been about 17, uh, and I, I am ashamed to recall that I addressed the, uh, the debating society at my school, King Edward VI School for Hampton, and I remember leading the debate that Britain should join the common market because it was good for trade and jobs. <laughs> well, we all make mistakes, but at least perhaps I now have the zeal of the convert. Now, as you know, I spend a lot of my time talking about the European Union and a great deal of time talking about uh, climate change as well, which is a subject that interests me enormously. Uh, and I will mention those very briefly, uh, Simon. But, but I, I just wanted to say that freedom and the Freedom Association is more than just Europe and more than indeed just climate change, important as they are. And Simon has already mentioned that on the way here, um, I went with, with my good colleague, uh, Neelam, who's over there somewhere. Yes, there she is. Um, to Stony Stratford. Uh, where there was uh, an event to protest against a proposal before the local council to ban smoking, not only in all the buildings of Stony Stratford, but in the parks and the gardens and in the streets and in the high street, um, which is, when you think about it, an extraordinary, extraordinary proposition. I was delighted to go. I saw the invitation, which I only got to in my, uh, on my computer in my uh, inbox yesterday, and I thought, no, I can't do that, I'm going to stay in my house. And then I looked at the time, and I looked at the location, and I thought, yes, I can, we can do both. And I went there. Uh, and it was quite fascinating. I personally hate smoking. I would be delighted if nobody ever smoked again, and I was never obliged to smell the smell of cigarettes. But the fact is, I represent 4.2 million people, of whom roughly a quarter smoke. And my belief is that we have to find a way of accommodating both those members of society who want to breathe fresh air and hate smoking, and those members of society who, knowing the risks, choose to smoke. There has to be a balance. And in my view, much as I hate smoking, the balance has gone too far. When I see smokers standing out in the rain outside their building smoking their cigarettes, uh, when I see a pub which has got three or four bars, one of those bars could be a, a smoking bar with a proper extractor fan and the appropriate arrangements, and so I felt it was a good opportunity to make that case. And I must tell you, uh, I was uh, in Brussels last week, and we had a chap called Andrew Lansley, you may have heard of. Yeah. And he, made, uh, he, he addressed the conservative group there. He, he very proudly told us that we were moving forward on the anti-smoking front and that we were looking at proposals to have blank packets of cigarettes and also packets of cigarettes with grotesque illustrations of disease, lungs, and... and, and <laughs> Uh, all the other things that, uh, that people suffer from. Um, and he said we're making great progress on, uh, on reducing the 
fat and the salt and the sugar in our food. Um, and I remember saying to him in that meeting, I said, should we not as conservatives have an instinctive presumption in favor of individual liberty? And should we not stop this nannying and this telling us what we can have and telling us what we can't have? I represent the East Midlands. In the East Midlands, we are proud of our Milton Mowbray pork pies. And I can tell you there is a certain amount of fat in them. And we are proud of our Stilton cheese. And we had a good old row about three years ago, I recall, uh, where we were, the, the, the food police were getting excited about 2.7% of salt in Stilton cheese. They never mentioned that in Rockhall, the famous French blue cheese is about 4%, and they wanted it to be reduced. I tell you, if you reduce the amount of salt in Stilton, it isn't Stilton anymore. So these are the issues that we need to address. Where is it going to stop? If they do these things to tobacco, I promise you the next thing will be out alcohol. You will be having a quiet and pleasant dinner with your spouse or significant other, we have to say these days, <laughs> and you will get out a bottle of wine, the music will be playing, the lights will be low, and there on your bottle of wine will be a diseased liver. <laughs> it has gone too far, and we've got to put a stop to it. Let me, re let me return very briefly to uh, my, my two hobby horses, and you know what they are. I won't get into climate change because, Simon, as you know, I could speak about it for an hour and a half and everyone wants their dinner. I will just comment on Chris Hoon, jokingly described as the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, and his new plan, his new plan um, to uh, increase our dependence on renewable energy, to increase the number of uh, offshore wind farms, was it from wind turbines from 8,000 to 14,000? People in the industry say he could never have done 8,000 by by 2020, which is what he was originally proposing to do. And as I said in a recent blog, frankly, uh, his new figure of 14,000 is on the far side of Fantasy Island. It isn't going to happen. And he doesn't seem to have realized that the wind is intermittent and that if you want a substantial part of your generating capacity to come from wind turbines, you have to build an equivalent capacity of conventional generation <laughs> And it has to be gas, because only gas can respond quickly enough. When the wind drops in 10 minutes, coal won't do it, nuclear won't do it. You've got to have gas, which you can ramp up in the same quick time scale uh, to make it good. So what is the outcome of that going to be? The outcome of that is going to be that our power costs are going, in broad terms, to double by 2020, that a million at least more families will be forced into fuel poverty, and I think on the official definition already, something like 20% of British families uh, are in the state of fuel poverty. I tell you, pensioners are going to die because they are cold in the winter. And don't tell me that climate change will make it warm enough for them because it won't. That is what is going to happen. We are going to damage our economy because we are actually going to have blackouts and industry will not be able to get a secure supply of electricity by towards the end of the current decade. And People are going to suffer. That is the result. And why? It will not make a scrap of difference to the climate or the trend of the climate. Climate change is natural. It is going to happen anyway. But we are told we will be leading the world. Britain will be leading the world in climate change. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the ultimate gesture <coughs> politics. We can stand back and say, haven't we been the good guys? We can bask in approbation. Meantime, China is building a new coal-fired power station every week, yeah. and they are not having any silly nonsense about carbon capture and storage. We are destroying our economy, and we are pauperizing our grandchildren in the name of a highly disputed scientific theory. And let me just give a quick plug for a book, not my book, there are copies of it down there, but a book to be published on August the 11th. I already have a sneaky <coughs> electronic copy by Matthew Sinclair from the <coughs> Taxpayers Alliance, and he's written a book called Let Them Eat Carbon. <laughs> and it goes through the whole question of why this is economic suicide, and also the huge numbers of people in industry who are making vast sums of money from the subsidies which are being offered by government, uh, and the whole thing has become a monstrous scam and has yeah. developed uh, yeah, yeah. a momentum of its own. Let me leave climate change there, but I'm sure we will come back to it at other times. Um, and let me just touch on the European Union. Lord Stoddart has said it all. I really don't have much to add, except 
just to look at this question of the euro. Because you know what is happening to the euro. You know what is happening in Greece and what is happening in Portugal and what is happening in Ireland and now is starting to happen in Italy. And years ago, people like me and Lord Stoddart were warning that this would happen. We said there will be asymmetric shocks, there will be all kinds of problems, and once you're locked into to the fixed exchange rate of the euro, the common currency, there will be no way out. And I remember in, I'm sure Lord Stoddart remembers too, 2004, 2005, 2006, people would come to us and say, here, we heard your warnings about the euro, it's going jolly well, it's a strong currency, it's wonderful, it's, you can travel from, from Brussels to Strasbourg to Spain with the same currency. Where are the problems that you reckoned were going to occur? Well, uh, we, we used to say, wait and see, they'll come. And we've waited and we've seen, and they've come. And they have a catastrophe, and I tell you, it is going to get worse before it gets better. They've had their stress tests of European banks, but mm. I don't think they included the European Central Bank, yeah. which has enormous holdings of dodgy sovereign debt. Because when those countries start going down, as they will, the, uh, the um, assets of the European Central Bank will be wiped out by them. Now, I don't know if any of you have read The Lord of the Rings. I'm very fond of The Lord of the Rings. In The Lord of the Rings, the bad guy, the Dark Lord, <coughs> has put so much of his power into the one ring that he uses to control all the other rings that when that is finally destroyed at the end of the story, everything that he has built with the powers that he had collapses. I think the euro is a bit like that. People will tell you that the euro cannot be allowed to fail because European politicians have put so much uh, of their credibility and of their political capital into it, they will not allow it to fail. Well, let me tell you what Roger Bootle, the famous economist who writes for the Telegraph and so on, uh, what he said. He said, no amount of political will will enable you to hit the moon with a pea shooter. He is yeah. right. Never mind how much political will they have, that will not get Greece out of the hole. And the only people who can get them out of the hole are the Germans at enormous expense, continuous fund transfers, basically paying Greece to stay alive and the German voter will not stand for it. I believe, and I agree with all Lord Stoddart says about the importance of mobilizing opinion and the importance of demanding a referendum on British membership, but I think that events are moving our way because I think when the euro collapses, and I'm sure in 10 years' time there'll be something called the euro, but it'll be very different from what we see today. When the euro collapses, then the credibility of the whole European project and all they have built with it will be catastrophically undermined and they will face an existential problem. And whereas most of the British people for many years have said they don't like the European Union very much, it hasn't been a hot issue. It hasn't been at the top of their priority list. But now they are seeing the massive increases in our contributions. They're seeing the demands for direct taxes. They're seeing the nonsense of the Human Rights Act and the fact that we can't deport Somali uh, criminals uh, uh, back to their home country. Uh, and they're seeing the folly of European expenditure, um, the new presidential palace for 260 million pounds in Brussels. But they're seeing above all the failure of the European Union's biggest single project, which is the Euro currency. This was the flagship. This was what Europe had achieved together and this is what is now falling apart. So let me end on at least a note of hope. I think things are moving in a very exciting direction. There will be huge economic damage and we have to find our way through it. And as Lord Stoddart said, thank God, we never joined the Euro currency. It's about the only thing I thank Gordon Brown for, actually. Um, but I can see an end game developing and I think we will see big changes which Although there will be economic problems on the way, these big changes will be in Britain's interest, and I look forward very much to that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.